I didn't get the uh, blue memo. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Zero. Tried telling you, but you were busy yelling at me in the DMV. Oh, well, I was, our, you know, the DMV is such a pleasant place anyway. <laughs> Did you have an appointment? Huh? Did you have an appointment? You didn't have to make one. I looked before. Uh, you have to have an appointment for certain services. I made my appointment. But yeah? Mm-hmm. Well, I was in there earlier and didn't realize that you couldn't pay your taxes. I didn't realize you have to have a check and not have checks. So I had to go get a cashier's check. You can't Ooh. pay with your debit card? Not the taxes on your vehicle. It has no. to be... Cash. Oh. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. So, uh, but overall, the experience wasn't as bad as I've had there. So It's much more streamlined now yeah it seems like i last couple of times i've had to go it's and the gals boom, are boom. a little more um peppy before they were not very happy to see people but there there's a whole new they have a whole new group of, of people in there so it's yeah. been yeah so it's, i think it's our dmv experience though is nothing compared to you know like my sister lives in st louis and i'm always astounded by like how long i mean that is a day chicago really yeah, yeah. are we rolling Sure. sure why not yeah you know, i was like i don't want to talk smack but uh yeah pre-covid it seemed like people were just not happy to be there which i can kind of understand because they mm-hmm. probably get walks of you know every life form in there mm-hmm. uh and then during covid i walked in and they're like yeah or i don't I guess it was like after covid kind of started waning you know and i was the only one in there and she was like do you have an appointment i was like no and i kind of looked around she's like you have to have an appointment so i had to go out to my car get on my phone, schedule an appointment, walked in. She was like, they'll see you over there. I'm like, son of a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess, yeah, just got to follow the rules sometimes. Yeah. yeah. No, like I said, it Even is. When it's, they don't make sense. It's, no. it's better than it used to be, yeah. though, that's for sure. So I, mean, I remember sitting there for hours before. Yeah. And now you just set your appointment, you show up, and you get your business done. Yeah. It's it was relatively easy, except for this pervert who came up behind me. I don't me. know who you're talking about there. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, ah, yeah, seriously, it was uh, Bobby Harry almost got an elbow to the face because I had no idea that he was standing on the other side of me. And when I was talking to the gal, he came up and like kind of whispered in my ear creepy. I was like, <gasps> and then realized. It kind of well, I didn't know it was you until I like walked by, walked by and then I looked, glance back. Yeah. Like, oh, it's Ashley. I better yeah. say something. Oh, oh my I gosh. thought you didn't know it was her as you were saying this. Oh no, I God, knew it was no. her after I no, saw no, no, it because no. I, I figured yeah. it out. And then I whispered sweet nothings in her ear yes, and he she sure almost did. smacked me. So. Yeah, I didn't smack you though, did I? No. Close. I think my lightning quick reflexes yeah. made yeah, me yeah, uh, was, avoid it, any bodily injury. It did you well. Yeah. Yeah. So it, was, it worked out well. So. so you guys wanted to talk about animals, which is going to make me sad, but that's okay. It's going to make you sad yeah. because of Seamus. Yeah. Well, okay, so let's so start with So are you saying the, now I have an opportunity to get some dogs who've been yeah. kicked out? That's what I was saying. So Ellen had messaged me on Facebook about, because I had shared a dog that kind of looked like mm-hmm. Seamus right. that uh, was lost. lost yeah. And um, the Western, um, mm-hmm. whatever it is, Western yeah. Illinois Clinic had yeah. the dog. Uh, and so I was sharing it. And I tend to share, if anybody follows me on Facebook, you know that that's primarily what my Facebook consists of, uh, sharing lost dogs and, and your kids and kids. Which is and, good. Yeah. Not so, lost kids. <laughs> not lost kids, my kids and then lost animals or animals who need homes. So uh, I shared the the Seamus look like, which mm-hmm. R. I. P. Seamus, uh, great dog. Yes. Um, but Ellen had reached out and was like, did, did it find its home? I'm like, I don't know. Reach out. Call him. Like, go get that dog because it looks so scared and so dog. sad. Go get that dog. So, uh, and then on one of my posts, one of my friends commented, hey, Quincy Canine Connection, it, I, that's what it's called, right? Yep. I don't want to get it wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're inundated with animals right now. And, um, you know, everyone knows that Muddy River News is working in conjunction with Quincy Humane Society and some of our sponsors to help do Pet of the Week. Uh, and and find some homes for these animals. And this person had said, are you going to ever partner with Quincy Canine or the other organizations out there? And right now it it's not happening. But what I will say is that Quincy Humane Society uh, works closely with these other organizations. So in helping one, we're hoping to help all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I will throw this plea out there that if you are an animal lover and you do have room in your home, reach out to the Quincy Humane Society, uh, Quincy Canine Connection. Homeward Bound. Wagon. Homeward Bound. Yeah. Uh, you know, if uh, Western Illinois, I don't know their euthanasia policy, but I know it's not a very long stint before they do euthanize these animals because they have to make room or they don't have money or whatever the hell the reason is. Uh, none of them are good enough, I don't think. But uh, 
we as a community, of course, we look out for one another as, you know, people, but we have to look out for the animals as well. So mm -hmm. I always say adopt, don't shop. And I know some people always prefer certain breeds, which is okay, but I strongly urge everyone to go to, you know, one of these organizations just to see if you can find, you know, your, your next forever, forever that's, love. That's what we will eventually do yeah. when we're ready. I just don't yeah. know if we're ready yet or not. So It takes some time, I think, yeah, yeah when you lose a pet. And there's no, you're never going to replace them because all pets have, you know, different personalities and, mm -hmm. and their own stories. But I just wanted to urge that and then also answer the question of, uh, no, we aren't picking favorites by going with the Qu Quincy Humane Society. No. Uh, my aunt is of you know very uh, loud voice for the Quincy Humane Society so that made it easier to kind of work with them but they do work with other organizations to help find these animals homes so uh, in working with one you are helping all animals right yeah yes. so go uh, go adopt go check out some animals go um, life is better when you have an animal I think or two or three or four or four yeah and oh when you have Lord. a when you are looking for a cat which um i think i'm getting luke talked into getting one uh because our two cats are not lovers they don't snuggle they don't they're just they're just scared most cats, cats no they're don't? they're sisters so they're codependent on one another um but they do recommend getting two cats at once because they are social animals Oh, so uh, you can have four cats? No. I figure my two cats will be the the second one to this other one. But okay. I want an older cat, uh, which is also something that I want to strongly urge when you're going. I know everybody wants a puppy. Everybody wants a kitten. Mm -hmm. But then you got to deal with the potty training mm -hmm. and the yeah. scratching and the, bleh, yeah. you know. So older animals are always a good choice as well. So that's my plea. Uh, and then to tie it into hurricane relief or recovery, um, Jody out at Silver Dollar today. Oh, she did amazing. Donated all of her tips to cool. help mm -hmm. victims of Hurricane Helene, and we all we always think about the people who are affected by it. But sometimes animals kind of get left behind as well, and especially with the devastation that's happened, animal shelters uh, around the world are going to be inundated because they all kind of transfer to try and help find homes. So, do your part if you can uh, for people or for animals. This is one of the times that I, st I think that the silver lining of community really kind of outshines or has the opportunity to outshine uh, devastation that takes place, right? Yeah. So yeah. we can all pull together and, and help, whether it's for our fellow humans or our pets. Right. Yeah, and I don't like I said we're not. I don't know if we're going to go the puppy route. We want something that's probably like a year or somewhere yeah. at least, or somewhere in that early you know stage. Right, so still we, formable. Formable, right. but yeah, but uh, yeah, let's get the potty training done. I don't yeah, mess with that. What a nightmare. Yeah, I don't it really wanna, is. I don't want to do that again. Do you have a favorite sure. dog breed? No, we've had like all kinds of mutts and stuff. I mean, but Seamus was our first beagle, and it was funny because we when we first got we didn't want a beagle, and then we got a beagle, and it's like okay, beagles are a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So I think we might go beagle again. I don't know yet. So you. Oh, I mean, when I lost Chubbs, who was my chihuahua, that was with me for my t entire young adulthood. I tried to replace him, like you said, yeah. after he passed. And I learned that um, no two chihuahuas are alike. And then also my new chihuahua, Piggy, isn't actually a chihuahua. He was... Uh, yeah, what is he? We don't... I mean... Would you ever do the... We did that. The 23andMe yeah. version for yeah, the so animals? He's... he's Yorkshire Terrier, Shih Tzu, um, Chihuahua. Uh, there was a couple other things, but no wiener dog. And he's just like this long. Yeah. Isn't little, that weird? Yeah, I don't know. But I love him. Yeah. He's fun. Uh, but I won't go the puppy route again after yeah. him. <laughs> and I'm not saying puppies are all bad. You just have to be in the right uh, season of your life to take on exactly. a puppy. Right? Yeah. Because uh, they are a lot of fun. So I don't want to diss on them too much. But older dogs and cats have so much love, especially yes. if they've, you know, gone through. A loss themselves. Right. Plus, well, yeah. Like I said, and Darcy being, you know, 13 or 14 or whatever, be like, get this puppy away from oh, me. Oh, yeah. I don't just need annoyed. all that. Yeah. 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 So and we, and we want to be mindful of her because she's still you know our baby as well so right, right, you know, right. so uh real quick i wanted to just uh switch gears to uh some uh, some more downtown stuff uh the new uh bar that is open reopen on the square mm -hmm. so uh c c kudos to those folks as we record this on thursday this is their real opening night is this wine gal and whiskey yeah whiskey guy, guy right? wine gal wine, wine gal, gal whiskey, whiskey guy, guy. yes yeah. whatever it is yes so it's, it's a it's a it's a cool name but it's a yeah. tough name to remember so um yeah we went there tuesday night um um, you know, Aspen uh, Ginnenbacher wrote a, a story about it, and then uh, Ellen and I went to their soft 
opening or whatever. And uh, yeah, it's, I mean, again, I, that place always has a, a great vibe to it. Um, and they got new, different bar stools, which I liked. Cause yeah. I always thought the revelry bar stools were kind of they were not weird. Great. Yeah. They didn't, didn't fit right or something. So. so now do they have it split where it's kind of like one side is geared one side's towards wine, the one women side's whiskey, and but fun. You can, but you can still do whatever. I'll be, catch I mean, me on yeah. the whiskey side. Yeah. yeah, yeah it's, sure. It was good though. I mean, it was, uh, it was cool. And I thought the, the prices were reasonable and I got the bill. I was like, Oh, that, not bad at all yeah. so um but again i'm it's always good when uh, you know that space is is vibrant and it's it's another option on the weekends to do stuff with so yeah. um and again the thursday friday saturday thing and then they're going to have it open like on sundays when you want to do stuff Mimosas and stuff, yeah. um and well special occasions and yeah, stuff. Oh, gotcha. so not yeah. just regularly Perfect. so mm-hmm. and again it's great if you want to go there then go to tiramisu or then go on the rail afterwards or wherever Boodle, whatever's downtown that you want to go to and get something to eat at or eat open i could list all the places so mm-hmm. so quincy but, brewing they got their sorry to me to cut you off go no, ahead you're fine. Go ahead. I'm so they if you haven't driven by uh on the beautiful new sixth street i i recommend it uh the quincy brewing company has an outstanding uh balloon display on the outside i was very bright i was like oh my god that looks freaking awesome i love uh i think it's the balloon gal maybe Mm -hmm. who who did that and somehow they're related i don't know but it's just a really cool it's kind it's a kind of a spectacle so i I think that's her tallest one it's so cool or at least like the highest one yeah she's done i'm Wondering if they climbed the ladder. I didn't watch it. They used a, a lift. They used like a boom lift. Oh. I watched them doing it. I was like, that is some that is some effort that went into it. And if you've ever done any kind of balloon arch, they're a freaking pain in the ass. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. yeah, this took. Uh, it was definitely a labor of love, but it looks so cool. So I recommend going to see it. And I don't. Is it their fifth year anniversary? It's their, that what they're celebrating yeah. their fifth year. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So kudos to them. And they got the new sign up for the promenade that yeah. i saw it's i guess it's is that the color it's gonna stay it's gonna be like that rusty whatever so they're not oh, painting i anything. don't know for a I fact but yeah i mean i'm pretty sure okay yeah so it, it's cool it's a cool design it's kind of tough to see it'll look at a certain really, angle that rusty will look good i think with uh like once they have the trees and everything in mm-hmm. you know the green and, and probably have a light shine on it or something maybe because yeah. mm-hmm. right now it's like it's just it's just it's a little camouflage right now at a certain angle. You yeah. got to look at it. I don't so think I've don't seen it. There, so so be, there I you go. Flush, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I haven't. It's well, right maybe there outside looking. of 8 Open that you okay. can see it. It's just like right there. Oh, okay. So. Well, anyway, it looks really cool down here. And I'm glad to see other businesses opening and, you know, tiff or no tiff. It's, it's good I feel, to I feel, see. I feel bad. I feel weird when I park on the bricks. It's like, I shouldn't be parking here. This yeah, is nice. Yeah, I kind of wondered why. Because it seems like it looks really, really cool. Yeah. But to have the brick be for the parking and the non-parking not brick. I yeah, wonder I would have done it came, the opposite, but yeah, I, I wonder, the designer. Yeah, I wonder what came to with that. But either way, uh, it looks really cool. I just want to throw that out there. And yeah, I think so. So, yeah, so I think, uh, again, kudos to everybody who's uh, working hard to make uh, this a cool place to hang out. Would you like to tease for our guest? Tease? Tease. Could give um, a little hint of what we're going to talk about and what well, we're going to do. So I was outside uh, listening to some of the story and – no teas needed. This is a um, very interesting and in-depth story. There's a lot to unpack. There's a lot of layers. Uh, if you know anything at all about uh, the Heart- Heartland, Heartland community, community, which I didn't know anything about it until this young woman reached out to me. Um, I know it was in the news a while back ago, um, 2001. So I probably wasn't paying attention to the news. Now you were partying. Point. Yes. Yeah. So um, hearing her story was um, very compelling. Also, we went there to revisit everything, and it was her first uh, time back there in seven years. So it was, um, yeah, it's it's very compelling. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a it's a wild story, and I know this is probably know, one of our wildest stories. I would say so. And what she said uh, was, she just wants to get the information out because she likes to let people know the truth who may not know what's yeah. what. So, yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad Muddy River gets to be Muddy River News gets to be a part of it. Um, I don't get to sit in, but I will be listening because it is sure to be a good one. All right, and we'll be right back. The Liquor Booth is your home for a huge selection of beer, wine, and spirits. The Liquor Booth has two locations in Quincy, 3520 Broadway and 1500 North 12th Street. The Liquor Booth, where it's always happy hour. This is the lake. And right over there is the Sharp Mansion. 
And this is Gracie's first time here in almost six years. years. Seven? Yeah. Oh, wow. What are you feeling right now? Kind of. It feels weird being here. There's a pit in my stomach, but at the same time, it's kind of like rem reminiscing a little bit. She said there's a, only two swans before, and there's a few more. All right, welcome back. I'm going to let Brittany introduce our guest. Okay, so our guest is my friend Gracie Woodward, and she is here to talk about Heartland Community. Um, it's also known as Heartland Christian Academy. But I want to give a little backstory about what Heartland is um, based on just some articles that I found on the internet, so that way our audience knows where we're coming from. And then I want you to tell your story. Um, and mind you, her story is one account. It's one person's story. Uh, it's her perspective on how she saw it, so um, these are her truths, and some people might not necessarily think they are the truth, but it, again, it's her truth. She lived it. She was uh, one of the children in the community a little bit after, well, quite a bit after um, there was some, uh, I don't know, disciplinary action that was investigated in 2001. So real quick, Charles Sharp. He founded Ozark National Life Insurance in 1964. This made him a millionaire. Um, and he decided to open a Christian school and community in rural Missouri in 1996, Heartland. The community included several businesses, homes, a dairy farm, Heartland Christian College, and Heartland Christian Academy. In 2001, authorities raided the school over reports of abusive disciplinary actions. More than 100 students were removed. Um, Sharp strongly denied the claims of these disciplinary actions. The raid led to several lawsuits, and 15 of those were settled outside of court. Um, Gracie informed me that most of those children were returned back into the community. Heartland eventually sued the state for, for violating their constitutional rights, but that fell through. Um, no reports were ever made but these accusations flew and it you know if you were a part of the heartland community and you were caught talking about them you catch yourself a lashing which kind of is a vicious cycle you know she to speak about the truth then to get punished or disciplined for the truth uh charles sharp died in 2017 at the age of 89 he is survived by his wife Lori sharp uh, from their website something about Lori. When Lori Emerson met Charles Sharp, she valued her independent spirit and her highly structured life. Once she and Charlie were married, she realized those two things didn't fit well anymore. Instead of finding comfort in her, in her independence and organization, she began to feel higher and higher levels of anxiety. Finally, in a search to help, for, to help and comfort, she turned to her Catholic roots. Of course, she took the journey secretly because Charlie wasn't interested in religion at that point in his life. And his Lori puts it, Charlie had a strong personality. So Lori began to uh, work for Charlie in 1981 as his secretary. They later married in 1992, the same year Lori found Jesus. From our understanding, she's carrying on the community there with a lot of help from some of the old community leaders. Yes. But as Gracie and I learned since our recent trip there, a lot has changed. So now I'm passing it on to Gracie who... Um, She's going to tell us a little bit about her story and um, her time spent there. So first, I guess, how long did you spend there just before we started off? All together, it was about 15 months. Um, at the time, it was right after my eighth grade year until right after my, so my freshman year. So a short amount of time, but it was like one of the most impactful times in your life as you were, you said, a freshman in school. It was, you know, when you normally get into high school, that's, that's your prime years. You look and find out who you are as a person. Mm -hmm. And being in that environment, trying to discover who you as, are as a person, but your every move is dictated for you. It's 
really hard to find out who you are. So not so f- formidable, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so what brought you to Heartland? Uh, at the beginning, my uh, bef- years before this, my father was in prison. At the time, I was an adolescent. I was in second grade. He went to prison. My mom and my siblings, as well as I, we moved to Michigan to get away from him because it was not a good home life at the time. Uh, From there, my mom still continued to use drugs and we bounced from city to city, state to state. And at the last part of everything, I got sent to North Dakota to live with my aunt because I was getting in trouble and they figured this was the best way for me. So my aunt started me with my back going to Shriners Hospital in Mm -hmm. Chicago. And uh, I had scoliosis, so they were either trying to figure out if I need surgery or not. Once it was decided, it was too late. My mom had already taken me back home. But we didn't have a home. She just took us back. We were homeless. We didn't have anywhere to go. And my surgery was still on. We found our way there. And I had my surgery, but while we were there, my dad, this whole entire time, was going through his own stuff in his own life in Missouri. And he was looking at either going back to prison or going to Heartland. And it was his parole officer that offered him that opportunity. And the judge is the one that accepted it at the time. So by the time that I saw my dad for the first time, I don't even know how long. Mm -hmm. It was my surgery, and my surgery lasted six and a half hours. And so that whole time, my mom and dad were talking for the first time in 10 plus years, and he invited us to go down to Heartland. And So while you're having <laughs> surgery, they're making major, major decisions. Major decisions, and we didn't know what it was at first. We thought we were just going down there for a visit. To see where he lived. Yeah, to see how the community was, to see what it was. Because everybody that lives there, they portray it as this beautiful, perfect place. Mm -hmm. And it's not. (laughs) What's the purpose of the place? The place, well, when people hear about it from the outside, they hear, oh, well, it's rehab, or it's a boarding school, or it's just a cult community which in all parts is partially true you have people from at the time we'll start there because Mm -hmm. things changed but at the time the men's center was the most populated there was hundreds i mean two three four hundred men in the men's center which is the men's rehab program they worked on dairy farms they worked with heavy equipment they did all the men's labor Mm -hmm. technically but they did all that while in the center going to meetings going to church the church was the biggest thing like you had that was a big part of the rehab program all of everything was centered around church but so everyone that was there was like sentenced there or not technically no um so in uh, our situation my dad he was sentenced there Mm -hmm. instead of prison we came for my dad and that's how a lot of families end up there okay but your dad so in in lieu of going to prison he had been in prison before though yes but in lieu of then returning to prison the judge gave him the opportunity said you can go to heartland the his parole his parole officer officer did that the one that said hey this is a thing would you consider it and how long had your dad been there before he talked to your mom and got you guys to come there uh, about 12 and a half to 13 months okay so he'd about a year then yeah. so so he had been clean off meth for okay about that time all right and then i and then you had said that the uh, the four the three to four hundred men i think that's one thing that you know a lot of people uh, be i'm familiar with the story growing up over there and then of course we're reporting in news of at that time um the fact that those men were basically the labor 
for the farm, for the dairy farm, and for everything else. I mean, and you, they built the houses. And they built the, the houses, community. and they built everything there, the churches, all that stuff. You used to be able to buy Heartland milk on the shelves, and yeah. it was in glass bottles, and they marketed it. And, I mean, they had ads on TV and stuff. I mean, it was a it was a big deal. And Charlie, Charlie had his weekly television program uh, that was on the mornings on uh, one of the local stations. I and that. Yep. I forgot about that. But, I mean, yeah, you, I mean heck, you were probably there at the time when yes. they were recording them. I mean, he would do these things in front of his full packed house his church and and it would run on every sunday morning and his tv and his commercials would run to say watch the charlie sharp ministries and all this and again and then when the when the the hammer came down from the state regarding the what was going on with some of the kids i mean i know there were stories of kids who were being uh, punished by you know getting put in the manure pits and things like that so and then again like you said everything kind of got settled so when when you were there and when you first got there what what was your initial reaction? I mean, when you first got there, and a couple three days in, maybe a week in, you're kind of like, oh, what? How? Did, what was your like feeling? after I after the bail got lifted off? Once I realized what it was, I guess when did, I guess how long did it take you before you realized, oh, this place isn't for me? So we were we were supposed to uh, visit for a week, mm-hmm. and once we hit that half almost a week mark i was like all right mom let's go i'm ready to get out of here mom had other ideas though no she's the one that said no we're staying ripped up the train tickets right in front of me and so it took less than a week (laughs) um wow and you said that that broke your like it broke your heart when that That broke my whole spirit i was devastated i like you're in the middle of a cornfield. You can't run. Yeah. But I wanted to. I will say also at 15, like, we don't always get to decide where we grow up, you know. It's like, yeah, I mean, that's not, that wouldn't be an ideal choice, but it was your parents' decision, and um, I guess she thought it was right for you, but like like we've talked about, it didn't do you um any good uh let's talk a little bit about just like your day-to-day life there uh beef like once i once you got settled in and, and they and was this before i entered the actual sharp house you, like yeah well no once you've entered so you're in the pro- you're not in the program but you're living there right? right so some people have to be in the program like your dad was yes but you were there just living there Right. So tell me, like, how it was living there, like, so what, the day-to-day, what you did. So at first, when we were first there, it was summertime, so we didn't have to attend the boarding school because we, were, we weren't part of the program. Um, at the time, we were in a one-bedroom hotel with two bunk beds for about four months before they finally decided that my dad could leave the men's center and we could all live together in a trailer on the edge of town. And then school started, we went to school, we had devotions every morning, we had Bible classes and we had church Wednesdays for What are like the times on that though? Because that was extensive. So devotion lasted how long in the morning? So... uh, before school actually started, we would go to the school. We'd sit in the gym. Uh, boys and girls were separated, and we would do devotions for about an hour. And then after that, that's when we would start school. And then we'd have a Bible class, which just like regular school hour. And then afterwards, each evening, we would have another hour of devotions. And that doesn't include Wednesdays, where you would have the devotions, Bible class, devotions, two hours of church. And then on Sundays, you would have devotions, three hours of church in the morning, two hours in the evening, and then devotions again after church. Basically, religion got shoved down your throat. And I know people that complain about going to Mass on <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> if uh, Mass lasts last longer whoa. than 50, 45 um, minutes, somebody's going to be mad. Right. Yeah. Okay, so but so that's like the day-to-day that went on for you. Um, you mentioned about getting in the mansion. So let's talk about the living situation, the different living situations at the time. So the men's house was packed. 
and they're on their own, right? Men's house was out on the dairy farm. They lived outside of the town. They would they had their own school buses to bring the men in for church and everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, women was significantly smaller at the max. I think I've ever seen 18 to 20 people in the women's home. Those looked like uh, sorority type houses. Yeah, they literally looked like sorority houses, just basic houses. And then the boys? The boys also the were same. In, uh, like a sorority house. Now, where did the girls live? The girls lived in Charlie Sharp's house. Uh, it was the basement, the main floor, and the top. And then on the side, there was a separate little apartment, which is where his wife and him lived. And all the girls lived in the middle. We all had different Girls, um, ages 14 to 18, was uh, it? About 14 to 18, yeah. So, like, the kids' kids, you told me, where did they go? Like, sometimes they, like, were farmed out to families? Or? So, in our situation, when my mom got in trouble, my dad got in trouble, my youngest siblings, which my youngest sister at the time was, uh, I think, 12 or maybe even 10, she got moved into a family with my younger brother, which was Jeff Whitman and his wife. And I have nothing against them. though They were great people, mm-hmm. uh, but that's where they ended up living. We weren't allowed to associate, talk to them, sit with them in church. So also living with your, your sister came along eventually, your older sister, um, and she was in the Sharp Mansion with you, but you weren't on the same floor? We weren't. Wow. Sorry. <laughs> Take a minute. Um, so, obviously, like, that was one of the biggest things is, um, and I hate saying this about, like, I'm not trying to make an accusation about a cult, but in cult-like settings, the first thing that they do is separate families. And you would think in, like, a situation like this that, you know, you want your family together, but... Um, her siblings, the only people she had, were torn apart from her. I know that um, her older sister had to be on a floor above her. She wasn't even allowed to talk to her sister at times. Um, let's talk, a li- if you, you can, can, a little can, bit more about the, the, the mansion I itself. I can go back to that conversation. Okay. Um, when we first got sent to the sharp house we were there and we expected to be able to be same room same floor this was just our expectation because technically we weren't in the boarding school and when we got there they were like they told me that my younger sister my older sister is going in the basement which is where level two is which is the people that have been there for years that can actually work and do normal things pretty much and then I was going upstairs um we weren't allowed to have private conversations everything was recorded um there were cameras everywhere and throughout the house uh you said motion detectors um there was audio we had staff members 24 7 overnight during the day you were watched all the time you you mentioned your younger sister was removed when your parents got in trouble. What did your parents do to get in trouble? So uh, when we all finally moved into a house, um, obviously this is a no addiction, no alcohol, no anything bad. Right. Um, my mom, she wasn't really ready to give up the life that she had lived when we were gone or even before which when you get to Heartland, you don't really have the resources to do things that you used to. So my dad caught her huffing duster in our shower in the middle of the night and she was basically seizing out and it, it devastated my dad and it sent him on a rampage, which also traumatized us as well because my mom and dad used to have a very abusive relationship that's why we left for Michigan in the first place. Mm-hmm. But my dad saw that. He left. He smoked a cigarette. That's why he got put back in the program, because he smoked one cigarette. They told on each other. Yes. Okay. My mom got put in the program, and because of everything that happened, 
they had a meeting with Charlie Sharp and the other leaders, which Chris Palmer and a few others, they all sat down and decided what happens to all of us as a family, which their decision was to split us all up. Okay. Our mother was our lunch lady, and we weren't even allowed to talk to her. We weren't even allowed to look at her. I didn't want to at the time. True. but That lasted for that punishment of the not allowed to talk to her mother was six months. Wow. Again, these are the formative years of her life. Um, um, talking about formative years. So, like, when I was 15, I was dating. Um, you told me a little experience about yours. <laughs> It where uh, if you can imagine, you know, you couldn't talk or do anything. Um, tell me a little bit about the dating life in Heartland. You so, said something about college and monitored dates, and so we'll start with what it is in high school, which is nothing. Um, every kid in school in high school did this. Uh, the boys and girls at the time they were separated. Uh, they're not anymore, but at the time, we uh, would sit in devotions in the morning, girls on one side, boys on the other, and somehow, some way, a message would get passed between us, and we would talk to each other, or we just, without even talking, without having a conversation face-to-face, -face, we would have a boyfriend <laughs> or a girlfriend. <laughs> Mine was Dylan. I don't know his last name. <laughs> I feel like those are kind of like the the relationships that we had in elementary school. Where they're like, now you're dating this person. I was like, I didn't sign up for that, but okay. Um, but you mentioned the call, so like oh. you weren't actually allowed to date until college, right? Uh, it, it, technically, yes, but they didn't call it dating; they called it courting. And so, once you're you go all through school, high school, elementary, whatever, you're not allowed to date. You're not even allowed to talk to the opposite sex unless you're related or it's a family friend. But after that, you enter college, and as you're in college, you are allowed to date other Bible school students because they have their own college out there. And it's accredited. Right. And it's accredited, mm -hmm. yes. And, and so you... She said something about there. I mean, there are people that technically lived there at the time that they were born there. Their their parents met in these courting relationships, and you know they had their family, and they've never left. The they don't know the outside world other than Walmart or something else. Like there's a girl that was in my class. Uh, she was born and raised there. So was her brother. And I just personally, I can't imagine that. Right. Uh, with the college and everything, you had your courting, you were supervised 24-7. You could hold hands, you weren't supposed to kiss or anything like that. You go on a date, you're supervised. But all your dates, everything that you do, it happened in Heartland. You couldn't go to a different city, anything like that. You were there. And you did what? Uh, you would go out to eat, you would go on a walk, or just... Where could you go out to eat? Uh, at the time, there was this, which me and Brittany, we went out there. There's no longer the cafe. It's now a thrift store. But there was a cafe. You could go out there. You could eat and talk, walk around, see the old cars. Or you could go down to the lake and just walk around, sit on a bench. But that's pretty much it. And you were supervised the entire time until you were married. Wow. Um, without, like, I, I hate, like, cutting to it, but so the disciplinary allegations, um, tell me, I guess, what you experienced with that. So from 2001, things are a lot different. Uh, obviously, they had to do something because things were going to keep happening. The kids got pulled out. Most of them went back. But when I was there, uh... They went from having, back then, like the girls would have these ugly dresses, and it, they look like grandma dresses. Mm -hmm. And that was before my time, but while I was there, all the uniforms, which if you're in the program, you didn't have regular clothes unless it was a special day, but you wore khaki sh 
skirts that went to your knees or your ankles and a navy blue shirt which you could have one button unbuttoned totally you, gracie style <laughs> yeah oh okay <laughs> <laughs> you look like a nun from walmart yes that's what she said. <laughs> I love her. nun yeah. from which you can go to salvation army you can find the clothes from heartland there yes and okay. I, i've seen it myself <laughs> we did a little thrift store shopping while we were there yeah um but okay so the punishment part you were a little bit of a rebellious person like you said going into this um there was something that happened there and to me it's like a normal teenager thing but it turned into uh, a little bit of a big deal okay so at the when you're not part of the program like if you're not in the boarding school your parents didn't send you here from out of state they can, uh, there's this paddle that they can swat you with. It looks like a boat paddle, just smaller. And some of them have Bible verses on them. Some of them have holes. And when you're in the program, if you do something wrong, there's the three Ds. Defiance, disobedience, and uh, I can't think of the last one at the time. But you can get swats that's what they're called Mm -hmm. as much as you want but if you're not in the program which at the time i wasn't and it was over a belly button ring Mm -hmm. that's the worst part it was over a belly button ring i I I got a fight over a belly button ring i didn't i didn't get punished this way like i could have just gave it to him and been done but at the time as she said i was defiant sure and so when you're not in the program they can administer 15 swats a day so I would, at the time, it's the principal, but it's the headmaster, Mr. Hudgens, and the assistant principal lady. You would go into the office, and there would be a regular seat in front of you. You you would have to turn around, put your hands where your butt would normally go, and your forehead on the backrest. And you, the assistant principal would watch while the headmaster administered. They'd give you three at a time, ask if you were ready to do whatever, admit or hand things over. In my situation, it was, are you ready to give us the belly button ring? No. I did that all through the 15, and I knew the next day I was going in, I had to do it again. So I did, and I could have easily just been like, here, take it, but I didn't. And then at the end of it, I finally gave up. I gave it to him and said, here, I got another one at home. That's... Wow. Um, I know some people are probably like hearing that story and they're like, well, you know, that's how I was raised or whatever in school. Or, like, I don't know. But times in the time that she was there, um, that's not how times are. That is no. considered no. abusive and still, disciplinary well, I'm, I'm, action. I'm, yeah, but even 15 swats back in even 1975 is, is a bit much, yeah, I would think. so. 2012, yeah. 2013. You're right. Yeah, no, no question about it. Yeah, no, it's, I did, yeah, I didn't want people yeah. like dis you know no on Don't. how extreme it was yeah um so and they weren't soft by the way let me say <laughs> that um, yeah i would imagine <laughs> especially on like a that khaki skirt too um you said i don't know if you said your your phrase yet but if you're leaving if you left oh what what could you leave i mean you could leave any family could leave um the uh, kids in the program could leave but if you were on a certain level like i said level two or level three you were you're allowed to have a job this is for like boarding school students you're allowed to have a job um girls was they worked at cafe or they were nannies but they kept your money until graduation if you left before graduation you got nothing they would either drop you off at salvation army in quincy and say good luck or they drop you off at the sign right outside Heartland in the middle of nowhere. And their phrase that they told everybody was, if you leave, you're going to hell in a handbasket. Sounds like you were already there. Mm-hmm. At the time, yeah. Um, are, you, do you, are you religious now? I believe in a higher power. I believe in God. Uh, I don't believe you have to go to church every Sunday. I don't believe you have to pray. I don't like everything that they shoved down my throat so much hurts. It hurts to the point where 
I want to rebel against it. I have my own beliefs. I don't believe that their way was the right way. I saw you had a couple of, of scriptures that were tattoos that were scriptures. So I mean, you don't you don't do those for unless you care about that right. and you want that that's part of your life so it's not like you're it's not like you've shunned all of that and i mean i believe and it did it like heartland did have a big impact on sure. my life there was negatives a lot of negatives but there was a few positives before i went there i had no structure because like i said my mom was a drug addict we bounced from place to place i lived by myself with friends and everything nobody told me what to do nobody told me how to do things and so going here i learned structure i learned how to clean i learned how to take care of myself properly so i mean that's the good part but most of it was bad like to have that positivity yeah. um anything in the life that you were leaving leading before this would have been structured and it's um unfortunate that like just someone taking care of you and giving you your basic needs is what made you feel like that was you know love and structure we uh when we went to heartland we ran into um well we were trying to find people to talk to right that's it was kind we of like about, a yeah. desert out there at mm -hmm. the time there was a um and not what what would you call it there was a big thing in the church going oh on. yeah there was that okay so that's probably why it was a desert out there there was a huge gathering in the church everybody was in the church while you guys were over there yes then. yes but we ran into a convenience store worker who had graduated the program and we'll show that interview um here so we're here at the gas station um which is actually like a really large convenience store too and she was telling me all about you know the the program yeah and um i was just gonna ask are you in it right now so i have graduated the program okay uh, my husband and i came here from tennessee and uh, we went to the program together and we came we were homeless we were drug addicts of 20 years we were lost we almost died a few times and we came here and he was in the men's center i was in the women's home and we didn't talk for almost a month, and he found Jesus, and I found Jesus. We didn't find religion, but we found relationship. And the people here loved us, um, and they didn't just start hugging us or, you know, that kind of love. They took care of our needs first. Mm -hmm. um, we needed a warm bed. We needed a shower. We needed food. You know, the basic necessities were supplied to us, and uh, we were just loved, and... They helped us learn how to walk our new life out because we aren't the same people we were. Yeah, you guys we're different. Were drug yeah. For years. Yeah. How long we have become, you been here? I've been here. This is my third year. Okay. Yeah. And so, then, do you live in one of the condos? No, so my husband and I live in a house. Uh huh. Um, I'm still in the Bible College right now, mm -hmm. so I I will graduate in May. So I've done two years. I've gotten associates in uh, nice. biblical teaching. That's so awesome. yeah. Is no, the college still? It is, yeah. Okay. And my, hus my husband works for assets management, which is like maintenance work. Mm -hmm. So, and I'll work here full time. Awesome. So, yeah. Well, yep. Thank you. Well, congratulations. Yep. Yes, yeah. Mary. Thank you. And yeah. That's awesome. Yep. Jesus changed my life. We learned a lot. She was the one that told us about the changes. Um, a lot of the, there was a lot of things that just kind of blew my mind because while I was there, Charlie Sharp was alive. Right. And so all these changes, I know for a fact, happened afterwards. It wasn't while he like, was alive. So it happened after he died. But yes. you changes, changes for the better or not for the worse? They didn't get worse. I don't know necessarily if it was better. The uh, lady we talked to, she made it sound like it was better, but that's what everybody at Portland sure. does. Yeah. Some of the th changes that we noticed while we were there, like you said, the cafe was closed. There used to be a zoo. There's like a clip on the internet somewhere of like zebras running around. Right, this I remember little, that. Um, yeah. That's no longer there. The housing for the 14 to 18 year old girls now is in a sorority type housing, and Charles Sharp's mansion is now the college. Mm -hmm. And then the college, what used to be the college in the gymnasium, is now the men's center. And they actually have a church 
like an actual church oh, it's, building now yeah, it's big. instead of the gymnasium of the school. And the overall population is much smaller now, correct? From what I understand, yes. Okay. I think that woman that we spoke to said it was around 100, and you said three to 400 mm -hmm. when she was there. So significantly smaller. Um, like you said, the dairy farm shut down. I think the cannery operation is substantially smaller. Um, there's, yeah, a, a lot has changed. And I, I wonder if it is entirely to do with um, Charlie Sharp's death or if just the exposure has something to do with it like kids are leaving she was a, a, a kid there at the time and now you're old enough to talk about your story and say your perspective of it again this is her perspective of everything um, maybe that is part why the population is Personally, I don't think it has anything to do with people's perspectives and them talking because a lot of kids that leave there, they don't they don't talk about that place. Nobody wants to talk about sure. that place. There's a lot of kids that got sent there at the age of 14 that spent the most significant part of their life there. They just want to forget it. Mm -hmm. So when, when you and Brittany went there, was that the first time you'd been back? Uh, I went back, uh, so I left there 2013, mm -hmm. right before my, right before I started my sophomore year, and I went back about seven years ago. Um, at the time, at the time I was on drugs. Mm -hmm. I went there with my family, and we went there to eat at the cafe, and at Charlie was still alive. This is pretty much right before he died. Mm -hmm. And that was, but this is the first time that I had went back with a clear mind. Mm -hmm. And it, it hit hard. Yeah, I bet it did. Gracie's been clean now for? Since August 20th, 2018. Congratulations. Awesome. <laughs> it's fantastic. That is not easy. So No, very proud of you. Um, I'm so proud to call you my friend. Uh, when she approached me about this story, again, I had no idea. I've, we've talked about things like in the past, but to not this. Like she said, this is not something you really want to talk about. Sure, I get so it. So it's like kind of strange to me that we were friends and I, you know, I didn't know this about you. And I thank you for sharing your story. Thank you for, you know, letting me join you on that journey there. I felt like a Dateline reporter. <laughs> uh, super out of place. <laughs> I'll bet. But it was, no, I, I, again, I think that the fact that you, you know, have the courage now to come out and talk about this, and I, I think that's part of the, you know, the overall healing process. I, I mean, think, like, a big part of it is I know what it was to me, mm -hmm. and then hearing a lot of people not even knowing it, uh, knowing about this place, like Brittany said, she didn't know about it at all. Mm -hmm. And then there's other people that really don't know about it. They just heard, oh, it's a cult. Oh, it's this, it's this. Like, I want to be able to express, I mean, it's, it's a compound for sure. Yeah. But, that, but it was at the same time, there's good that can come out of it. Yeah. You get what you make out of it. And, and at one time, it was a pretty noticeable and functioning business with like i mentioned earlier the you know the ozark steakhouse like you talked about and then oh yeah that's the closed down too. the mm -hmm. yeah everything so was everything was closed but but you know still like you said you had the dairy and you had the you had his ministries and all the stuff they had their own doctor too yeah yeah it was it was a it was a city within itself and a compound and of in the true in the true sense of the word until you know, things got out of hand with uh, with the discipline, uh, the excessive discipline, the state getting involved, and then uh, again, I don't I don't know what Charlie's death ended up the impact of it, but obviously, you know, when you are the when you're a type of person that he was, as you know, rich and you know, you've got all the resources that you can. Obviously, you're going to be able to do a lot more. And with his passing, I mean, obviously, that's going to take a big chunk out of that. Mm -hmm. Right. I do think um, the overall lesson that I took out of this, like I'm not always fond myself on organized religion, but th the idea that you're giving people who are in desperation um, their basic needs and then calling that Jesus's love is um, yeah. 
not what I think most people think of when they're thinking of a higher power, religion, yeah. Jesus. Yeah, love is uh, love's unconditional. It doesn't have. There's never a okay. I'm going to love you if you do this. That, that's yes. not how it works. Yeah, you go so. from rock. Is so a lot. They feed on the weak. And sure. I hate to say that, but, but they, they feed on the weak. They go for the people that are rock bottom, have nothing, barely even clothes on their back. And they say, oh, Jesus loves you. That's their phrase. Jesus loves you. It used to be on the milk trucks Jesus and everything. Jesus is the answer. Yep. Jesus is the answer. Mm-hmm. Yep. And so they would that. invite all these people in that were at rock bottom and then give them clothes, give them food, give them a house, give the, just everything that's basic necessity that we have in our day-to-day lives. Yeah. And so, of course, they feel like they owe something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's what started it all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. No, no question that about and, it. That uh, and Charlie Sharp. I did see uh, an interview with Charlie Sharp. I believe it was, it's online. I think it might have been. KHQA's Roger Maples, and she, it is a very dated interview. Yeah. And um, she asks him why, when he had all this money, did he not buy an island? And he said, Lori and I don't really like islands much. <laughs> and I felt like I needed to take a shower after that. He actually, so I don't know if this was in any article, but he actually grew up in that area that yeah. Heartland was mm-hmm. built. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And his story is he uh, was an alcoholic. He drank, almost drank himself to death. And then one day he went out. He was walking through a field by his old house where he grew up. And God talked to him and told him that he needed to build a city. Which is strange because, like I said at the beginning of what Lori said on her website, he was not a religious person in 1992 and then that's the year that you know she married him and she found jesus and then sometime between 92 and 96 the opening of heartland yeah i guess and so maybe god told him to do that that it happened maybe uh, she found god and then he found afterwards and then because he owned that insurance company he's like i can do this yeah that i mean that could be a possibility yeah okay do you have anything else no, just a thank a huge, yes. huge thank yes. you for doing this. Um, I know it wasn't easy, um, and I know, uh, like you said, we're gonna we're gonna roll a little bit of our journey there. And like you said, I'm I'm never going back. So, cheers to never going back. Cheers. I am fine where I am. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much thank again. You. I appreciate it, and thanks again. Thanks for sharing your story. I enjoyed hearing what I heard from that lady I it makes me feel good knowing or thinking that I know that things are better but at the same time like I still had that pit in my stomach seeing there being there and just a lot of things flooded back and I I wouldn't want to go back again to be honest with you just feeling like I was out of place feeling like I was doing something wrong being there and then just feeling what and I And that's felt. coming from, like, exposing, like what we said. Yes. Like, talking about all of it and just technically, basically reliving it as I talk about it. There's things that I brought up today that I forgot about because I blocked it out. And then feeling it and experiencing it all over again, it was, it was a lot. 